Greetings. As many of you know, um, my name is Norton Mezvinsky. Uh, I taught here uh, for a few years, uh, and I retired uh, just a few years ago. Now, it's always a pleasure for me to introduce a friend, and it's even better when I have the chance to introduce a friend whom I greatly respect. Uh, a few weeks ago, I had the pleasure of introducing Rabbi Yaakov Shapiro as a speaker at the International Council for Middle East Studies, an organization in Washington of which I'm fortunate uh, to, to, be, to be president. And now uh, I have the opportunity uh, to uh, introduce him here at CCSU, a place that uh, well, I already mentioned that I taught for, for 43 years. Yaakov Shapiro is the rabbi of an Orthodox Jewish congregation in Queens, New York. He is one of ultra-Orthodoxy's most prominent public intellectuals, an author of four books on Jewish law and philosophy. He is presently completing his fifth work, a three-volume work of Orthodox Jewish opposition to Zionism, Jewish nationalism, and the and a Jewish state. Rabbi Shapiro has often spoken on the radio and has uh, delivered speeches uh, in um, the United States, Israel, and Europe to uh, various audiences. He addressed an audience, for example, at the European Union. Last week, last week, he was the featured speaker at a rally of tens of thousands of Orthodox Jews in Jerusalem who were protesting the Israeli draft. This protest was widely covered by the Israeli media as well as by media in the United States. I think you will find Rabbi Shapiro's presentation both novel and incisive, as have many other audiences. Zionism is the heart center philosophy of the State of Israel and has in most ways provided the basis for what has been called by many the Jewish state or the state of the Jews. Too often overlooked is the conflict between Zionism and Judaism. The title of Rabbi Shapiro's presentation today, as I'm sure you know, is Zionist op Z Zionism's Opposition to Judaism. After he speaks, we'll of course have a question and answer period. Rabbi Shapiro. Thank you for the kind words, Professor Mazvinsky. It's always an honor to be introduced by you. I want to first thank the Middle East Studies Program here at CCSU and the International Studies Program for inviting me here to speak. The odds are I'm probably not a typical type of speaker that the college is used to. And honestly, this audience is not the typical audience that I'm used to, which is great. Diversity is uh, what makes the world go round. Um, normally, when you hear lectures about Zionism, uh, anti-Zionism, uh, Zionism versus Judaism, the, the content is usually focused on one topic, the conflict between Israel and the Palestinians. This is unfortunate because there is much to say about Zionism that has nothing to do with the conflict about Israel and the Palestinians. And I'm here to explain that today. The default discourse on this topic was deliberately hijacked so that whenever somebody speaks about Zionism, immediately the question arises, okay, are you for the occupation or against the occupation, yes or no? Are you for the Palestinians or against the Palestinians? Which side? It's like a color war. If you speak about one team, you automatically have to involve yourself in this conflict. This is unfortunate. It's like um, 
if let's say you were to sell, tell somebody you are against Donald Trump, what that means by default is that you're voting for Hillary or maybe Mickey Mouse. Between me and you, I voted for Mickey Mouse. <laughs> but if, if let's say I know other things about Mr. Trump that I'm very opposed to, perhaps I worked in his building and I'm opposed to his business practices, and I say I'm against Donald Trump, and then people would tell me, well, what do you mean? Who do you want for president? Hillary? It would be quite frustrating. Because I'm not talking about the presidential election. I'm talking about a completely different conflict. That's what I'm going to be discussing today. At the end of today's lecture, you could be pro-Israel, you could be pro-Palestinian. My lecture will not impact on that in the slightest. Instead, I'm going to focus on what Zionism is so that we could better understand what makes Israel tick, the ideas behind the founding of the State of Israel, and whoever side you're on, at least you'll know who the combatants are in this conflict, because people really don't understand. There are many ideas that people assume, because they assume it, uh, the point of view that I'm going to say doesn't get a chance to be heard. People assume that Zionism is, and this is how Zionists define it, the national liberation movement of the Jewish people. I'm going to argue that that's completely false. You'll also assume that Israel's the Jewish state, or actually Professor Mizvinsky uh, said it's either the Jewish state or the state of the Jewish people. Happens to be there's a big difference between the two to the point where when Theodore Herzl wrote his book Der Judenstaat, there are two different ways to translate that. Either the Jewish state or the Jews state. There's a very big difference. <clears throat> I'm going to argue that the entire assumption is not true. Israel is not the state of the Jewish people, nor is it the Jewish state. Another assumption that people have is that Zionism is somehow based on Judaism, or somehow connected to Judaism, especially the, the idea that God promised the Jews the land, and Zionism is a fulfillment of God's promise. I'm going to argue that that's completely false. In fact, was an idea that was taken from Christianity, not Judaism. We're going to start by accommodating uh, a request that was made at the APAC convention last week. A Rabbi Gordis, I believe his name is, um, I had never heard of him before, even though his Wikipedia article says he's one of the most 50 influential Jews in the country or in the world, not sure exactly. But he said that there's a problem with Judaism in America and in Israel. The problem is that we speak more about the conflicts that Israel has with Hamas rather than the ideas that, that created Israel. We have the United States of America. We speak about ISIS, he said, much, much more uh, than we speak about Thomas Jefferson. And if you want to understand what America is, you need to understand Thomas Jefferson. That's what we should be speaking about. He said, by the same token, if you want to understand Israel, instead of speaking about Hamas so much, we should be speaking about Vladimir Jabotinsky and Micha Yosef Berdyshevsky. These were two of the great um, thinkers who, whose ideas are today's Israel is based upon. We're going to accommodate that. We're going to study Jabotinsky, and we're going to study Berdyshevsky, and we're going to see exactly what their ideas were. First, if we're talking about a Jewish state, I'm going to ask the question that the British committee asked Theodore Herzl when he first mentioned the Jewish state to them. They asked him, what is a Jewish state exactly? Now, you should know that in the, the surveys that they, when, when people write books, and when people take surveys, and they ask, different people tell me what a Jewish state is. There are several different answers that people give. Some people say, well, it's a state where Jews can feel safe. Others say it's a state with a Jewish character. Others say it's a, uh, the nation state of the Jewish people. The way the state of Israel defines it, and you'll find this on Israel's website, is written by Avigdor Lieberman in this particular piece. It says that 
what Japan is to the Japanese and France is to the French, Israel is to the Jews. What he's saying is it's not merely a state that benefits the Jews or a state that was created to help the Jews, but rather it's an integral part of Jewish identity. Without France, would you have French people? Without Japan, would you have Japanese people? Without Israel, would you have Israeli people? Oh, see, there's the trick. It's not that without Israel, you wouldn't have Israeli people. Without Israel, you wouldn't really have Jews. If we're going to accept this definition, that Israel is to the Jewish people, not Israel is to the Israelis, what France is to the French and Japan is to the Japanese, what that means is, in some way, which um, Lieberman does not define, Israel is integral to Jewish identity. And without Israel, Jewish identity would be changed or reduced or disappeared somehow, some way. So they asked Theodore Herzl way back when, what is a Jewish state? So he said, well, state, we know what a state is. So I said, okay, so what's a Jew? And this is where we have to start. I'll give you my definition, which is the Bible's definition, and Theodore Herzl's definition, which is not the Bible's definition. The Bible's definition is the verse that describes the creation of the Jewish people in Hebrew goes like this, Hayoim hazen which means today you have become a people, or a nation, or a society. However you would like to translate that word, um, it's related to the Arabic umma. We also have a word umma, am and umma are similar words. Could be translated a, a, a nation, a society, a people, however you like it. But that day that the Bible was discussing, was talking about the day that God gave Moses the Torah on Mount Sinai. A bunch of people came out of Egypt. They were not a Jewish nation yet. They are a bunch of uh, refugees from Egyptian slavery. Then they came to Mount Sinai. God came to Moses and gave him the Torah. Hayom hazen, salom. That's what made the Jewish people the Jewish people. The Jewish people in the desert where they had no land, it wasn't in any country, they had no common uh, state, they weren't any territory, but they came a f became a full-fledged people because of one reason, because they received the Torah and on Mount Sinai. That is the only common denominator that all Jews have. Now this is the way Jews have defined themselves for thousands of years, almost a thousand years ago. Rav Sadir Gaon, who was born in the 800s and died in the 900s, said that the Jewish people are people only because of their religion. If you take me, for example, I'm an American. My father's from Poland. My mother's family's from England. Um, around the corner from me lives a nice Yemenite Jew. His name is Yichia. His family's from Yemen. They've been there for hundreds of years. What do I have in common with Yichia that makes us both Jews? We did not speak the same language. Jews haven't spoken Hebrew in thousands of years. We know that one of the national uh, symptoms of people are the common language. There are those that say that's the most important <coughs> symptom of a nation. Jews have not spoken Hebrew in thousands. If you want to see something very interesting, uh, go to YouTube and, and punch in Netanyahu Pope. Netanyahu had a meeting with the Pope uh, last time he came to Israel, and um, uh, they had a very interesting uh, conversation through an interpreter, of course. Netanyahu was braving to the Pope about the connection between Israel and Jesus. And he said, Jesus lived here, and he, he lived in this land, and he spoke Hebrew. So the Pope corrects him. He says, no, Aramaic. The Jews spoke Aramaic, not Hebrew, when they had the Second Commonwealth. Now, if you, you look up this this clip and you see Netanyahu and the Pope and you don't know which is which, which is Netanyahu and which guy is the Pope, the Pope is the one wearing the yarmulke. <laughs> That's how you can tell who's who. <coughs> I have no common language with this guy Yichia. We don't eat the same foods, we have no common culture. The only thing that we have in common is that we are brothers by both receiving the Torah on Mount Sinai. And this is the way Jews have identified Jewishness for, for thousands of years. The Jews had a specific type of national, or I'm using the word national uh, uh, colloquially, I don't mean it literally, uh, uh, national values and goals. 
our goal, our value, was, as the Torah said, our mission, to be Mamleches Kaihanim V'Goy Kodosh, which means a kingdom of priests and a holy people. Kind of like, uh, by way of analogy, um, you imagine the priests in Shangri-La, or Kunlun Mountain, or, um, I don't know, X-Man Island, or something like that, where you have a group of people that have a specific mission, and they segregate themselves, and they live there. And our mission was to study the Torah and fulfill the Torah. We had no aspirations to win gold medals, and we had no aspirations to win wars. And we had no aspirations to be athletes. And if somebody wanted to, that's their choice, no problem. But it was not Jewish value ever. I'll tell you two things where you can see this. You know, languages always reflect the culture of a people. So if you want to know, if, let's say, I don't know, a thousand years from now, uh, if, if America no longer exists and they were studying the culture of America, uh, what I would do if I was uh, studying it, I would look at the American language, the English language they spoke in the United States of America, and see the idioms that they use. And I would see that, well, they have, if somebody is, um, uh, we could sometimes, if somebody does something unfair to somebody else, he hit below the belt. Sometimes you're behind the eight ball. If you really made a good speech, they say you, you hit a home run. Um, if you late to class, you're MIA, missing in action. And all of these are references to athletics, to military thing, to fighting, and in every language they have such idioms. But not in Yiddish. If you take a look at the idioms and the expressions in the Yiddish language that the Jews spoke in Eastern Europe, that you will find not a single reference, not a single figure of speech that refers to athletics, that refers to physicality, that refers to war. These were, were values that were eschewed by the Jewish people. We were, we, were, we were not a military people. We did not like violence. We did not like war. In fact, we are enjoined by the Torah that when we, we are in exile, which we, we have been for the last 2,000 years, we are not even allowed to fight wars. We are instructed, it's wise advice from the Torah, which comes from God, to run rather than fight. Now, other people may look at this as cowardice, but he who turns and runs away lives to fight another day, or lives another day at least. <laughs> if you were, and, and, and there really is no cowardice in this. We never took pride in being stronger than other people. There is no pride. There's no shame in getting beaten up by a bully. Do you know why there's no shame in getting beaten up by a bully? If you are ashamed of getting beaten up by a bully, you lack self-esteem. Let's say it wasn't a bully that beat you up. Let's say it was you were attacked by a gorilla. Would you feel shame that you were beaten up by a gorilla? Would you feel like a coward that you ran from a gorilla? When anti-Semites attack Jews, the pogroms in the late 1800s in Russia. There was no shame in that. You know why? Because the anti-Semitic pogromchiks were like animals, but worse than animals. According to the Jewish religion, your status depends upon your choices, not the size of your muscles, and not how many people you could kill or beat up, but your choices. And Jews were proud. Jews were proud even when they were persecuted. You know what we were proud of? We were proud that we were not our persecutors. When Jews were persecuted, we were proud that we were the victims and not the persecutors. Nobody wants to be a victim. It's painful. It's hurtful. It's damaging. But shame? No. Just like a person would not feel shame if he was attacked by wild animals, there is no reason to feel shame when you are attacked by bullies or anti-Semites or, 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 or evil people, even if they are stronger than you. And if somebody does feel shame, that's low self-esteem. We looked at the anti-Semites like animals. And all we wanted was to be left alone to pursue our studies and our religious devotion. The Columbia University historian, Salo Baron, spoke about the ghetto. He says that today people look at the ghetto as the epitome of evil. But he points out that the Jews, about a thousand years ago, voluntarily created the ghetto on their own. And he had a good line. He says, quote, there were locks inside the ghetto gates, in most cases before there were locks outside. 
Take, for example, by way of analogy, the Amish, or again, the, the people in Shangri-La, Kunlun Mountain. We wanted to be segregated, and, and, and uh, Selo Baron may have not been aware that there was an even earlier ghetto that the Jews voluntarily segregated themselves in, and that was when the Jews were in Egypt, enslaved by the Egyptians. The holiday of Passover is, is, is coming soon. And we know that the Jews, when they went to Egypt, segregated themselves in the town called Goshen, away from the rest of the Egyptians. Why? Why do we segregate ourselves? Very simple. Why does the Dalai Lama segregate himself? Because it's more conducive to his mission. Why do you lock yourself in a room when you have to study for a test? Because it's better for your mission, and that's what's important to you right now. I have a friend who's a medical student, I can't speak to him because he's always busy studying. No problem. Jews are also always busy studying. Not everybody has to follow the Jewish religion. Well, God said you do. It's a person's choice if he chooses not to. But if you want it to be, if you wanted to have Jewish values, these were the Jewish values. Jews name their children after righteous people, not after war. We don't have one war hero in our religion. King David was not known as a war hero. You know, King David was known as the author of the Psalms. And if you analyze all of the Psalms, which King David wrote, you will find very often that he complains about his enemies and he, he prays to God for the, the demise of his enemies, but not once will you find in the Psalms written by King David about how strong he is and how he's going to take an army and beat his enemies. Here's the king. He's a king, and in those days a king wasn't like today a king. A king over there was a real monarch. He was, he was a dictator, and he could have done whatever he wanted. He could have taken an army. He didn't brag about his strength. In the entire book, nowhere in King David's writings, you will find such a thing. You will find him praying to God. God, please take care of my enemies. Please, God, save me from my enemies. He turns to God. The Jews, I'm not asking you to believe my religion right now. I'm, however, I'm describing to you what my religion is. I'm not asking you to believe that Adam spoke to a snake. That's up to you. I'm not asking you to believe that God split the, the Red Sea. That's up to you. But the Bible says that Adam spoke to a snake and God split the Red Sea. And the Bible says that when the Jews went to war all over the, 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 the Bible, they won through miracles. How many times did God strike their enemies with blindness? How many times did the, the prophet Elisha brought down... Uh, fire from heaven, as did the prophet Eliyahu, Elijah. How many times it said when it said in the Bible when Moses held his hands up and, and, and focused on God, then the Jews were successful in wars. The Jews did not win wars according to our religion through, the, through strength, loy b'chayil v'loy b'koyach, not through strength, uh, not through military strength and not through power, but rather through my spirit, says God. Jews believed, and they still do, that they are saved through God. You know, there's a story. Yeah, they, they, the Jews did have an army, and I want to explain to you what kind of army. I'll tell you a story. This is from one of our big rabbis, Rabbi Chaim Soloveitchik, his name was. He was known for his incredible insight into things and his foresight. There, there, there was, he died in 1917. Um, the anti-Orthodox Jewish Jews in those, those days, the Maskilu, they used to always poke fun at the Orthodox Jews, or the, the ultra-Orthodox Jews, we could call them, and uh, make fun of them, and um, they, they, they made a play mocking the Bible. And what they did was, they, you know, they, they had a story about the, the Mashuach Mulchama, the priest, uh, the anointed priest that that gathers people to create an army. And as it says in the Bible, the priest gets up there and he says, okay, everybody, anybody who uh, is afraid of their sins going to war should go home and can't fight in the army. Our tradition says that anybody that was guilty even of a minor rabbinic infraction cannot fight in the army because, in a voluntary war, because um, Jews won war because of God, not because of their strength. Half of the people, the recruits, went home. 
Anybody who just recently built a house, go home. That's what it says in the Bible. They went home. Anybody who recently got married, go home. At the end of the, the, the um, selection process, there are only two people left for the army. Um, Rabbi Chaim Soloveitchik himself and, and, and Rabbi Yisrael Meir Kagan, two, two elderly ancient rabbis, were sitting there, and that's the whole law. And this was, was funny. You, you're laughing, and you should be laughing, because it was, it was a funny skit, something for Saturday Night Live. Um, <laughs> Alec Baldwin played Reb Chaim Soloveitchik, only joking. <laughs> but they came to Reb Chaim, they came to Rabbi Soloveitchik, and they said, what do we do? We need to answer this. This is a mockery, right? So he said, let me see the paper. And he looked, and he said, uh, the first uh, the scene, the first uh, part, this is true. The next one, this is true, and this is true, and this is true. And it's all true, except they left out one part. We won the war. That is, in Jew Judaism, how the Jews won the war. That's how we believe. I'm, again, I'm not asking you to believe that Adam spoke to a snake or that God meted out um, uh, the plagues upon the Egyptians or he split the Red Sea or that the Jews had supernatural powers in war and that's the only reason why they won because of God. But that is the only reason why they won. We are not military people. We don't name our children after military heroes and we do not have any sites, any uh, holy sites or or uh, prominent sites of military uh, victories. Let's say the Alamo, Gettysburg, we don't have anything like that in our religion. All over the Tanakh, the Bible, every other page after the Jews go into the Holy Land, there, there are wars. Be this nation, everybody's attacking everyone, there are wars. Yet you ask a, a, a rabbi, where are the sites of these things? We never celebrated those sites because we don't celebrate wars. We don't celebrate violence. The relationship between the Jews and the Holy Land, the land of uh, Eretz Yisrael, the land of Israel, that the Jews entered with, with Joshua, it was not a national homeland. Again, we became a nation before we went into the Holy Land. The Holy Land is considered not a national homeland, but rather a holy land. It's like a giant synagogue. It's a holy land. It's imbued, endowed with holiness by God, designed for, for righteous Jews to serve God within it. If you're not a righteous Jew, you don't belong there. It's for Jews, and it doesn't matter. Sovereignty is not an issue. We did once upon a time have kings. There was King Saul, King David, King Solomon, and the purpose of the kingdoms was because that was more conducive for us to serve God. The law was that a king of the Jews had to hold with him the Torah, the book of the Torah, all the time to remind him of what his real duties are. Our goals were purely religious. God gave us this land to fulfill the religion. And he said, this is very important, if you do not fulfill the religion in this land, if you worship idols, he watch out, lest your heart pull you away, and you deviate, and you worship other gods, I'm going to kick you out of the land. And that's what happened. And God sent us into exile. And we all say, all Orthodox Jews pray, because of our sins, we were exiled from our land. Because the land was not a homeland, it was a holy land given to us to serve God with. And very simple, if you, don't, if you abuse it, it's taken away. Use it or lose it. It was never a national homeland because Jews were never united by common land or common language. We have a whole language, the Lashon HaKodesh, the Holy Hebrew Tongue. But it wasn't a national speaking language. It's true that once upon a time Jews did speak it, but for thousands of years we did not, and it did not matter to us. There is no mitzvah, there is no positive thing to speak the Hebrew language. Especially if, and this is... Uh, many of our commentators say this is why we don't speak Hebrew anymore because if you pollute the language then you're polluting a holy thing. The language is holy. It was written by God, the holy Hebrew language. And if you don't use it properly, use it properly or lose it. We don't speak it anymore. Aramaic. We don't have a national language to speak. Re relationship to culture, there is no such thing as a Jewish culture. There's an Eastern European Jewish culture. There's an American Jewish culture. What is Jewish food? Bagels and lox is Jewish, Jewish food. I'm not sure why exactly they decided bagels and lox is Jewish food. 
<laughs> chicken soup, as everybody knows. Um, if you go into a Jewish neighborhood, an Orthodox Jewish neighborhood, you will find that the most popular foods are pizza and sushi. <laughs> I'm really not joking. There's no such thing as Jewish food. You, you want to eat chicken? Eat. There is no such thing as a Jewish culture. Again, me and my Yemenite guy that lives uh, around the corner from me, um, uh, they eat, I don't know, they don't even, uh, they don't eat sushi, they don't eat pizza, they eat Yemenite food, which is fine. We don't have a, we have one thing, a religion, and one goal, one national aspiration to fulfill the will of God. That's all. Now, after the, a little history, after the emancipation, and, and Jews had an opportunity to leave the ghetto and, and to um, join the colleges and to join the, the non-religious world, there, there were many Jews that had what I call a Wizard of Oz complex, which means they thought that over the rainbow there was something noble and great over there, and they wanted out. The problem was that um, a lot of them assimilated, but the non-Jewish anti-Semites would not accept them. In 1881, the Russian pogroms started, and uh, millions of Jews eventually had to leave Russia. And it was the secularized Jews, the assimilated Jews, that were also targeted. Assimilating did not help the uh, Jews become Goyim. And by the way, there are many people that think, I, I don't know who invented this idea, that the word Goyim is some kind of pejorative, it is, it is not. It just means nations or Gentiles. In fact, if I just quoted the verse from the Bible that describes the Jews as Goy Kodesh, holy Goy, a holy nation. And the Goyim did not allow the Jews to, they, they wouldn't accept them into their, um, their, their clubs, they wouldn't accept them as Goyim. So, so, so the religious, they didn't want to be religious, and they, didn't want, they couldn't be Goyim. So now they're stuck between a rock and a hard place. The heretics, the ones that didn't want to be, what are they going to do? So they embarked upon plan B. Plan A was assimilation. Plan B was to re-engineer the Jewish people. The Jewish people to them were disgusting, sickly, ugly. Who in the world, if he could have an opportunity to be a baseball player, to be a football player, to be a soccer player, if he could be an a, a, a Olympic gold medalist, why would he want to be a rabbi? Why would he want to be Tevya sitting and, 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 and being busy a whole day with his, his, his religion? So they decided they embarked upon a social engineering project that was going to change the Jews, change their values, change their characters. It's true, the Jews ran from a fight. You consider that cowardice? That's your choice. I know that if my son asked me a question, said, Father, if I am approached in the streets by a burly man asking for my money, should I give him my money or should I fight? And I'm 90% sure my son tells me that I could beat him. What would you tell your children? Fight or give him the money? And what if he asks for your clothes? I would say, give him your clothes. And he asks you to stand on your head, stand on your head. The 5% chance, the 1% chance of getting killed is not worth it. Perhaps you would give your children different advice, perhaps you would not. That's what I would, and that's our choice. And that was the Jewish choice. We did not want to fight. We'd rather run. These people considered it shameful, and they wanted to change the Jews to become more like the Cossacks more like the anti-Semites, more like the tough guys, rather than like the Jews. How are we going to change the personality of the Jews? The non-Jews will not allow us into their societies. The Jews, we don't want to be part of their disgusting society. The only solution is to change the Jews, change their character, and make them into, well, the opposite of the Jews. Now let's quote Vladimir Jabotinsky. One of the founding fathers of Zionism, and by the way, today's Likud party, the dominant party in Israel, is based on the Zionism of Jabotinsky more than anybody else. Benjamin Netanyahu considers himself a student of Jabotinsky. Netanyahu's father, uh, Bensia Netanyahu, was actually a right -hand, one of the right-hand men of Vladimir Jabotinsky. Jabotinsky said, he said, what is a Zionist? What do we want to make the Jews into? And he said like this, he said, it's impossible really to give you a model of what a Zionist is because there is nothing like it right now to compare it to. But if you want to know what a Zionist is, here's what you need to do. Take a typical Jid. A Jid is a derogatory name for Jew, kind of like kike. Take a kike and take all his personality traits and characteristics. Imagine their diametrical opposite. 
and that's going to be a Zionist. He called it a Hebrew quote. Because the Yid, the Jid, is ugly, sickly, and lacks handsomeness, we're going to endow the ideal images of the Hebrew with masculine beauty, stature, massive shoulders, vigorous movements, bright colors, and shades of color. The Yid is frightened and downtrodden, so the Hebrew will be proud and independent. The Yid is disgusting to all, so the Hebrew will be charming to all. The Yid likes to hide with bated breath from the eyes of strangers. And the Zionist, the Hebrew, will should march ahead to the entire world, look them straight and deep into their eyes, and hoist before them his banner, I am a Hebrew. <coughs> the Zionists, more than anything else, wanted to change the Jews, their characters, their values. Let's go to Michal Yosef Berdyshevsky, the other man who in APAC conference said we should study. Michal Yosef Berdyshevsky said, described why the Zionist movement is important. He said that the values of Judaism have destroyed the Jewish people. Apart from turning us, as a quote, into spiritual slaves, men whose natural forces had dried up and whose relation to life and the world was no longer normal, therefore we have to make a revolution. It cannot arise other than by a total overturn, a total transvaluation of values, which has been the guidelines of our lives in the past, our hearts, ardent for life, sense that the resurrection of Israel depends on a revolution. The Jews must come first before Judaism, the living man before the legacy of his ancestors. We must cease to be virtue, to be Jews by virtue of an abstract Judaism and become Jews in our own right as a living nationality. The traditional credo is no longer enough for us. He ends his speech by saying, his essay, to be or not to be. We will either be the last of the Jews or the first of the Hebrews. They wanted to change the Jews into another nation with a transvaluation of values. By the way, that's a Nietzschean phrase. Transvaluation of values. That's what they wanted to do. These were the, some of the leading thinkers, the Thomas Jeffersons, the George Washingtons, the Patrick Henrys of the state of Israel today. This is what they wanted. How are they going to do it? Well, we're going to synthesize a new nationality. We'll create a new identity for them, for ourselves. Now, if you want to create a new identity for yourself, there's two ways to do it. Let's say, we'll take Norton as an example. I hope you don't mind. Let's say Norton doesn't want to be called Norton anymore. <coughs> Sounds like something out of an old television show. So he wants to be called, so he wants to be called uh, Ahmad. Norton wants to be called Ahmed. So there are two ways he can do it. He can either just change his name to Ahmed, or wherever he goes and say, I'm Ahmed, I'm not Norton. Norton I never heard of. But if that's the, but there's a problem with that, because if you say, Norton, where were you, uh, Ahmed, where were you a professor? Or well, CCSU, I don't see you on the list. Where were you born? What is your history? You can't just make up a new identity in the middle of nowhere. There is another thing you can do. You can kill somebody and then take his birth certificate, take his identity, and become Ahmad. The Zionists wanted to change the Jewish identity, but not by creating a new, a new national identity. There actually were those who tried. They were called the Canaanim. There was a movement in the early Zionist days by guy Yonatan Rotosh, which was a small but uh, disproportionately influential group of people who said, we're not Jews, we're Canaanim, we're a new nation. But it, it fizzled out quickly, because why would anybody want to be Canaan. So instead what they did was, we said we're going to kill the old Jewish identity. The religion, that's not the definition of a Jew. A Jew is a nationality. Uh, in those days they referred to it often as a race. But they didn't really mean race. They meant what we call today nationality. Uh, a Jew is a nationality. A religion is only the constitution of the Jewish people. It's the national religion in the same way that the Greeks believe in Zeus, but you don't have to believe in Zeus to be a Greek. Uh, Jews believed in uh, God, uh, the creator of the world, uh, Hashem, but you don't have to believe in Hashem to be a Jew. In fact, uh, how many Greeks today believe in Zeus and how many Vikings believe in Thor? And how many Jews believe, why do the Jews have to believe in God? We go instead, we're going to change the Holy Land. We have a, a, a the Holy Land, we're going to change it into a homeland. We're going to change Hebrew into a national language from a holy language. And this guy, Ben Yehuda, actually sat down 
to try to create a new language, Ivrit. It, it, it resembles ancient Hebrew, but it's not the same language at all. And I'll give you certain, I, I, I'll give you some examples of, of not only is the language different, but the content was designed specifically to change the identity of the Jew. I'll give you an example. There's a phrase in, in, in uh, biblical Hebrew, Karen Kayemes. Karen Kayemes means, it's used in one context, it means everlasting fund, eternal fund. It's referred to when, when a Jew fulfills a mitzvah, God's command, he gets rewarded in the afterlife. Today in Israel, the phrase Kemen Kayemis is the Jewish national fund. What used to refer to uh, 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 accumulating mitzvahs for God now refers to accumulating money for the state. There was a phrase, Bitochen. Bitochen comes from the uh, root betach, which means trust. But the form, Bitochon, only appears in one context in ancient Hebrew, trust in God. That's different than trusting in people. The word betach refers to trusting in bitach. Today, bitachon in Israel refers to homeland security, <coughs> national security. There was an angel of fire, chashmal. At the beginning of the book of Yechezkel, Ezekiel, I think it's, it's referred to in English, it, it, it refers to him, chashmal. Today in Israel, chashmal means electricity. In the olden days, we believed in angels. Today, it's technology. There's a word that we use when we refer to God. Now, we know God has no real eyes, no nose, no mouth. He's not physical. And yet, in the, the Bible, it refers to the eyes of God, the hand of God, outstretched arm. But those are what we call anthropomorphisms. To indicate an anthropomorphism, we added the word kaviyochel. Kaviyochel means in a manner of speaking. And it was only used in Hebrew, in referring to God. Today, in Israel, the word kaviyochel means like as if. Whenever you say something that's like a kaviyochel, as if. The idea was to change the holy, holy identity of Judaism to a national. I'll give you another common example. Everybody knows the story where by Passover, Moses came to Pharaoh and said, let my people go, right? Let my people go. Sounds like a, a national liberation movement. But that's not what it says in the Bible. They, they, they dropped one word. In the Bible, Moses comes. God tells Moses, go to Pharaoh and say, let my people go that they may serve me. It was a religious demand that Moses made to Pharaoh, not a national liberation demand. Yet today, let my people go became the national liberation cry, and they left out the religious part. <coughs> This is what they tried to do. Now, Ben-Gurion, the early Ben-Gurion, by the way, the idea of uh, the, the land being promised to the Jews unconditionally is not a Jewish idea. Ben, uh, David Ben-Gurion did invoke the idea when speaking to the, the British committee. He said, the mandate, the British mandate is not our Bible, but the Bible is our mandate. And that is our claim to the land. Quote, I can only point to our Bible and to its sequence in the many Jewish initiatives to regain Israel, stretching across the sense of centuries, and say this is our mandate. <coughs> now, the same man, David Ben-Gurion, also said, the one that said God promised the, the land to the, to the Jews, and I quote, since I invoke the Torah so often, let me state that I don't personally believe in the God that it postulates. I mean that I cannot turn to God or pray to a superhuman almighty being living up in the sky. I'm not religious, nor were the majority of the early builders of modern Israel believers. Yet their passion for this land stemmed from the book of books. That is why the socialists of the Bilu movement rallied themselves with reference to Ezra, who brought the Jews to the Holy Land. And it is why, though I reject theology, the single most important book in my life is the Bible. In other words, and many have said this, but it is absolutely true. I don't believe in God, but he promised me this land. <laughs> Where did he get this idea? Where, who came up with this idea that God unconditionally <laughs> promised the Jewish people the land as a homeland? Well, as early as 1585, a Christian from Cambridge published a book called, quote, 
the glorious and beautiful garland of man's glorification containing the godly mystery of heavenly Jerusalem. That's really the title. Where he mentions the Jewish national return to Palestine. Francis Kett, his name was. In 1609, an English priest, Thomas Brightman, wrote a pamphlet called, I hope I'm pronouncing it right, Apocalypsis Apocalypsios, describing the process of the Jews' return to the Holy Land and their conversion. In it, he called for a Jewish state in Palestine in order that the prophecies of his religion, what we would call today evangelical Christianity, would be fulfilled. He said, only if this happens will England be blessed by their God. He also predicted the conversion of the Jews to Christianity in the year 1650. The first Zionist was neither Moses Hess nor Theodore Herzl. Kett and Brightman lived a few centuries before either of them. As time went by, the Christian Zionist movement gained momentum. Quote from the first quarter of the 17th century, belief in a future conversion of the Jews became commonplace amongst the English Puritans. And a large number of them taught that there would be a restoration of the Jews to their ancient homeland in the Near East either after or at the same time as their conversion. The Jews who needed support, the Zionist Ben-Gurion who needed support in his attempt to obtain the Holy Land, particularly from Britain, leveraged the British, which were mostly a Puritan country, there, there wasn't Catholic, this is not a Catholic belief, this is a Puritan belief. He leveraged this Christian, Puritan, what we would call today evangelical belief, that the Jews are going to return to the land, even though he didn't believe one word of the Bible. He, he was a completely non-observant Jew. He didn't eat kosher Ben-Gurion, he didn't keep Shabbos, nothing. Just one thing he cared about, God promised him the land because, not him, he took that from the Christians. And in order to obtain the support of the Christian world, this is what they claim. Now today, Benjamin Netanyahu very often cites, he was at Auschwitz, Benjamin Netanyahu, and he, he, he made a speech, uh, this is a, five years ago I think it was, and he described a prophecy in, in the book of Yechezkel, Ezekiel, of chapter 37, where, where dry bones uh, come out of the ground and grow flesh and they become alive. And, and he said that this prophecy is fulfilled in the creation of the state of Israel because the Jews were like dry bones and now, now they're alive again. Now, I, I remember hearing this from him, and, and, and this is so foreign from a Judaic interpretation. Thousands of years we've had common things. Nobody ever said such a, such a thing. So, from a Jewish perspective, there's this... I, I was thinking, where did he get this from? And I did some research. This is a over 100-year-old Christian evangelical explanation. And Benjamin Netanyahu used it. So the Christian evangelicals, the next day, and the Christian Broadcasting Network were all, they were hopping and saying, oh, even the Prime Minister of Israel says that the Christian prophecy is fulfilled of Ezekiel 37. The Jews didn't understand that he was quoting uh, Christian theology. What they did was, in order to recruit the Jews, they, they, they created a whole new version of history. A history where the Jews were always poets and soldiers and politicians, where King David wasn't the, merely the, the there was, it was a minor uh, blot on his, uh, just like drop on his career, that he wrote the Psalms, but really he was a warrior king, and the Jews were warriors, and then unfortunately we went into exile and we got all messed up, <coughs> and now Zionism really brings back the real Jewish character and personality. No question about it. The Zionist idea of Jewish identity and Jewish character is completely incompatible, and Jabotinsky said it. It's not me, it's Jabotinsky. Bertoshevsky, and there's more, Herzl said it too, is the exact opposite of the classic Jewish personality. But they needed to say that they're Jews because this way they're somebodies. We're the ancient Jewish people, support us, Come back to your heritage. They created the, the, the nation that the Zionists created, the Jewish nation, is synthetic. It's a mythology. It's a delusion. There was no such nation ever. They, never. The Jews were, were a religious holy society, not a, a, a society of people like Arik Sharon and David Ben-Gurion and, and, and Vladimir Jabotinsky. In fact, 
Yair Lapid's father, Tommy Lapid, had said that if Moses or Maimonides would come back today, they would say that we, Tommy Lapid was completely unobservant and anti-observant, we are the real Jews and not the ultra-Orthodox. Now, the most, the most powerful point of prop, uh, method of propaganda that Israel has is their army. Last week, as uh, Professor Misvinsky mentioned, I spoke at a protest with many thousands of people against the draft in Israel, and I know that there are people that don't understand why we refuse to, to serve in the Israeli army. Shouldn't we be serving our country? I once spoke to some diplomats in the EU, a fine man named Gap, Leonello Gabricci. He told me that you guys have a PR problem uh, because the people are saying you're just freeloaders, you don't want to serve your country. I will explain. If the Israeli military was a regular military that just defended their country, that would be one thing, but it's not. The Israeli military was designed to be much more than a military. It is because there's no separation of church and state in Israel. The Israeli military is an indoctrination camp for the Zionist religion. I have over here quotes from the officer's training manual. Discussion points are, this is in an army. What is Judaism? Is Judaism a religion, a way of life, or a constitution? War according to Jewish values. What, and etc. What rights does any army have to, to shove down the throats of its recruits religious indoctrination? Now, if you want to join such an army, go right ahead. But do you have a right to draft kids into the army and then force down them, force them to go to your religious indoctrination? Can you imagine if the United States Army, let's say we'll call the United States a Christian country just for the sake of the argument, would come and tell the recruits that your, what you learned in parochial school from your priests is not true. Christianity is not a religion. Christianity is a nationality. What you learned is not true. We in the army and the government know about religion. Would anybody say that they are entitled to draft people into the army? There is no security reason for Israel to do this. They choose to inflict their ideology, their Zionist ideology, their anti... My, maybe Lapid is right that Moses would say he's the real Jew. That's fine. But you have no right to, 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 to draft people and require them to go through religious indoctrination. If that's what you want to do, then you have no right to force people to go there. Make your army into a normal army. Make your state into a normal state. Don't call yourself the Jewish state. What The Jewish state means, according to Israel, an actual part of Jewish identity. What France is to the France, Israel is, is, is to the Jews. Stop that. If you would become a normal boy, Bulgaria, if Israel would become Bulgaria, call yourself Herzl stand. You're not a Jewish state. You're a state. You, you want to be a, a, a shelter for Jews? Be a shelter. Emma Lazarus the, was a Zionist, the one that wrote that, that little blurb under the Empire State, uh, the Statue of Liberty. Give me all your, your, your persecuted and you he said, give me all your Jews, no problem. But they created an ideology. It's a religion. It's a nationality. It's not a country. It's not just merely a service provider for the Jews. It's an actual religion, a civic religion, a nationality that they have. And they foist and they say that our religion of Judaism is wrong. Now, more than that, we know there are different types of nationalism. There's a liberal type of nationalism that, let's say, we have in the United States of America. Being American national means that I live in New York, but if, some, if California is attacked by the Japanese, for example, I will have to go to the army to help them. And in return, we pay taxes. It's kind of like a social contract between the people. There is a more organic, we'll call it, a romantic type of nationalism that the Germans had, that um, uh, there's something intrinsic to a nation. There was 19th century philosophy that said nations are the natural evolution of society and that there's something intrinsically called the German, intrinsically called the Frenchman that somehow separates them from other people. That's organic nationalism. Now the Israeli nationalism is not merely an organic nationalism. It goes further. Israel claims, different than every other country in this world except the Vatican, not only to represent its citizens, but they claim to be the to represent all the Jews all over the world. 
Benjamin Netanyahu came to Congress the, uh, just recently and said, I'm here speaking in the name of all Jews. Naftali Bennett wrote on his Facebook page that Benjamin Netanyahu is not merely the Prime Minister of Israel, he's the Prime Minister of the Jews. This means that Israel doesn't merely claim to represent its citizens, it claims to represent all the Jewish people in the world. What kind of nationalism is this? Now, I, I'm born in America. My family's from Poland on my father's side, England on my mother's side. And some guy, listen to this, some people in the Middle East in 1948 created a country and they decided that's my nation state. Is that not oppressive? If I don't like my government over here, I could move to Canada or Mexico if I can get past the wall. I go to Mexico or Canada or Bolivia or wherever I want, and, and I'm free. According to international law, you can choose your own nationality. You're not bound to where you are. If I'm an Italian, I can choose. But wherever I go, if I go to Mexico or Bolivia or Canada, I cannot escape the state of Israel claiming that they are my nation state because I was born into a certain religion. And they don't even have a definition of a Jew. What's a Jew? If it's not a religion, what makes somebody Jewish? That's a whole other story. The definition that Israel has of a Jewish person is not the same as the religious definition of a Jewish person. This is an oppression. And there's, a, there's an actual measurable damage done to Jewish people all over the world because of this. The greatest database of anti-Semitic activity is held in Tel Aviv University in the Cantor Center. Every year they release a report on anti-Semitism. They're not activists, let's say, the way the ADL is. They are actually scientists. And every year the report invariably says that because people mistakenly conflate Zionism with Judaism and Israel, they claim, think that Israel represents the Jews, Whenever Israel gets involved in a controversy all over the world, during the Gaza War, uh, during other wars, Jews all over the world suffer, anti-Semitism rises. If you could make a graph, and they did, between the rise and, 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 and reduction of anti-Semitism all over the world, and a parallel uh, uh, line of Israel's uh, getting involved in controversy, they would be parallel lines up and down. And if you want to know if anti-Semitism goes down one year and things are peaceful for Jews, it's because is, things were peaceful in Israel. Jews are blamed all over the world for what Israel does. And this is a crime. This is a crime because uh, Israel claims not only to represent the Jews, their, nas their, their nationalism goes further than that. Such a radical type of nationalism. You know the controversy, the question is anti-Zionism, anti-Semitism? Well, clearly it's not. I say Zionism is anti-Semitism. But if somebody is against Israel, does that mean they're anti-Semites? Yair Lapid said they certainly are. Not because that they're hiding behind anti-Zionism as an excuse to harbor their anti-Semitism, but he said, since Israel is the essence of the Jewish people, you hear this? This is a type of nationalism. This is a really organic type of nationalism where, where, where the people are just cells in the body and Israel is the body. We, Jews, all over the world, are just cells. We are parts. Israel is the whole. It's like a voodoo doll. Whatever your attitude is towards Israel defines your attitude towards Jews. And if you are against Israel, if you criticize Israel, by definition, not that it's, that's not a symptom that you're an anti-Semite, by definition, you're against the Jews. Now, why do the Jews buy into this? Why would a religious Jew buy into this? In short, there was a rabbi. His name was Rabbi Avram Yitzhak Kuk. Before him, he, he died in 1935, before Rabbi Cook, there were religious Zionists, but they had a different calculus. They, they didn't buy into any of this philosophy. They just figured that, you know what, the Zionists will make some kind of safe place for the Jews to, to live, uh, but, but it's not, Zionism really isn't an ideology, and they, in their naivete, they figured that the Zionists weren't interested in changing the Jews, just helping them. That's been refuted many times. But Rabbi Cook changed the, the, the uh, playing field. He took 
19th century nationalist philosophy, Hegelian philosophy and various things, and he literally plagiarized it, took it on his own, wrote it in Hebrew, in mystical Hebrew language, and presented it as if it's Judaism. So that now you have a, a man who presented that Judaism is nationalist, and if you're more nationalist, you're more Jewish. If you're more loyal to the country, if you, 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 you uh, till the land, if you're, that, that means by definition you're a better Jew. He made it up. To this day, they don't find sources. His, even, his closest uh, students have not found sources. They just figure it's like uh, the, the myster, mysterious Kabbalistic things beyond our ken. But we know Rabbi Cook's philosophy is taught in colleges all over the world. If you have a course here in 19th century nationalism, I could find you uh, parallels, even identical ideas in your course. And I could show you Rabbi Cook's writings. They're the same thing. Rabbi Cook's students became what we call today the settlers. They mixed nationalism with religion. To them, nationalism is a religious duty. Fighting is, an, is, is, is a religious duty. Fighting for the land is a religious duty. Uh, being part of uh, the, uh, nation, nationalism is a religious duty. That makes you a better Jew. And what you have today, the settlers, that is all, every single one of them, bar none, our students are following the, the, the uh, ideas of Rabbi Cook and his son. By the way, the Rabbi Cook senior, Rabbi Avram Yitzhak Cook, who died in 1935, was a pacifist. He didn't believe in wars. His son, Tzvi Yehuda, was a militant. What they did was, today the settlers, they took because they figured that since nationalism is Judaism, guys like Jabotinsky, guys like Ben-Gurion, really are spouting holy doctrine. So they take the, the land worship of the, the early labor Zionists, of a guy like Aaron David Gordon, uh, the, the, it's, it's pagan land worship, and they believe that's Judaism. And then they take the, the uh, militancy of Jabotinsky, and that's Judaism. They mix it all together. And I want to tell you that history shows nationalism mixed with religion is a very bad combination. Those are your settlers. Other Jews, you're going to tell me many people, Jews support Israel. I want to explain to you why Israel has a, a trick that they use to gain support. They tell Jews, listen, you may not agree with our philosophy, but you've got to support us anyway. Because there was a holocaust and Hitler's coming and, 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 and they didn't think Hitler was going to come, but he came. And there are anti-Semites all over the world. And who's going to protect you when Hitler comes? Only us. Forget about our religious differences right now. We're both hated by the anti-Semites. So even though you don't agree with us, support us, help us. Tell people, let, let's show a united front so that the anti-Semites will be intimidated by our unity. And they'll show that they can't divide us and we're not going to be victims. And there are Jews, Orthodox Jews, there are Orthodox Jews who are Zionists, but many, I can't believe that there's any Orthodox Jew, unless he's a really hardcore Zionist, who would agree with Israel's definition of a Jewish state. What Italy is to the Italians and Jap Japan is to the Japanese, is they, they took surveys and, and they asked people what's a Jewish state. Different people have different ideas, so here's what happens. They go to the Jews and they say, Jews, look, we're all under attack, you've got to help us. Even though you don't agree with our philosophy, even though you think we're heretical and, and, and we're anti-Jewish, but look, you know, when, when Hitler's coming, he's going to throw the religious ones into the concentration camps as well. And then the Jew says, this is why a Holocaust is so emphasized. There are more Holocaust centers than yeshivas in most out-of-town communities outside of New York. You go into the Holocaust Center and you learn something about Israel. You learn that you're in danger. You learn that it can happen tomorrow, and it will happen tomorrow, except for the fact that Israel has a very strong army, and therefore, even if you disagree, you've got to support it. So now the Jew says, you know what? 
I, I, I really hate what the Zionists are doing. I'm really against Zionism, but I need to, to, to show some unity, otherwise Hitler's going to take me away. Then they tell the rest of the world, look, the whole world is Zionists. All the Jews support us. We are the state of the Jewish people, when in reality, they're not. Philosophically, ideologically, they are very opposed to Zionism. They're just scared. Imagine you're, you're in a car going 60 miles an hour and it, you hit a skid. During the skid, the guy who's driving the car, you hate his guts. But he says, look, let's put our differences aside. Hold the wheel until we're safe. That's what the Zionists tell. Hold the wheel until we're safe. And they constantly reiterate the anti-Semites, the terrorists, Hitler, the Russians, the pogroms. Throughout history, Jews were persecuted. Do you want to still be persecuted? Forget about Support us. The truth of the matter is that the connection between Jewish, between Israel and the Jewish people is the most dangerous thing in the world for Jews. As I said, Tel Aviv University says statistics show because people think that Israel represents the Jews, Jews all over the world suffer. And in Israel, I mean, how has this safe place worked for them? More Jews were killed in Israel than anywhere else in the world. If there's going to be a Holocaust, God forbid, according to what we see, Who's a bigger danger? Iraq, Benjamin Netanyahu, Israel says Iran's a nuclear danger to them. I'm not scared of a nuclear Iran. Israel's scared. Which is, Israel's the most dangerous place for Jews. But ideologically, they need to, they, they, they need to, to, to uh, uh, support their ideology so they disguise it in security. I'll give you an example. They insist that Jerusalem should be the capital of the Jewish state. Is that safer? Will that make more peace or more problems for Israel? Everybody knows it's going to make problems. There's going to be a big cost to life if they do that. But Benjamin Netanyahu says Jerusalem was always the capital of the Jewish people. He's a liar. It was not. It was a holy city. A capital is only a political concept. If you have a country where the government buildings are and stuff, that's the capital. Jewish people never had a capital. We had a holy city. He changed it to a capital of the Jewish people. Again, it's the Jewish people. It's not Israel. This is an ideological, this is an ideological position that comes at a cost of security. They take ideological positions and they say, we need this for security. Support us because of the security. But really, it's ideology. This conflation of ideology and security. Say, we need to draft you into the army. How could you not serve your country? Yet in the army, they say, you know what? Let me explain to you what Judaism is. <coughs> no. The, ide the conflation between ideology and security is what gets Jews to support Israel. Now, we're going to end with that. Except for one more point. It's clear that Zionism is not Judaism. But there are many people who think it is. Um, there are two types of people who insist, though, that it is. Many people think it is. My friend Morty, who's in the audience, travels all around the world. Last year he was in Vietnam. Uh, this year, what, uh, Cambodia he was, uh, Cuba, whatever. And he meets people. A and the people always tell him that they, they think that Jews well, that, that means Israel. And he says, no, Judaism is a religion. It's, we have nothing to do with it. Don't blame us for that. And they're really relieved to hear that. It takes 30 seconds to explain to somebody. I met a woman in the street who was walking by while we were making a protest. And, and she asked me, what, what are you guys protesting about? She didn't understand. And I said, 30 seconds. Or two, may I ask where you're from? She said, Colombia. May I ask your religion? She said, a Baptist. I said, question for you, is being Jewish like being a Colombian or a Baptist? She said, you know, that's a good question. I said, it's really like being a Baptist. But the Zionists tell everybody it's being like being a Colombian. What would you do if there are people that said being a Baptist is not a religion, it's a nationality like Colombia? I said, I'd kill them. I said, now you got it. That's what we're protesting. I'm not killing anybody, that's what we're protesting. People who insist that Zionism is Judaism are one of two types of people. People who insist. 
They're either Zionists or anti-Semites. Anti-Semites want people to think that Zionism is Judaism in order to discredit Judaism. Zionists want people to think Zionism is Judaism in order to give credit to Zionism. This is why you will find anti-Semites, especially of the white supremacist type, guys like David Duke, insisting, he said, don't, he wrote about me, David Duke. We had a protest uh, about three, four years ago against the draft here in, here in New York. He said, don't believe what Rabbi Shapiro says that Jews is not Zionists. Jews are Zionists. He's lying to you. All he cares about his people going into the army. All that we, we know recently, this, this, this uh, alt-right supremacist Spencer had an argument with uh, a, a rabbi, a Hillel rabbi in a university in Texas, and he said, I don't know what you want from us alt-white people. You guy, you Jews made an ethnocentric country in Israel. We want to do the same thing in America. But no, it's not an ethnocentric country. If, if anybody wants to know if the connection between Judaism and Zionism is damaging, is dangerous, or uh, helps the Jews, all you have to do is see what anti-Semites who want to hurt Jews, like David Duke, like the neo-Nazis, like the white supremacists are saying, and all of them, all of them, go to Stormfront website, all of them, everybody should know Zionism is Judaism. We know that if this is what they're saying, that's not good for the Jews. Statistics show that. It's a big mitzvah to explain to the world, and it's for the sake of peace, that Judaism is not Zionism. Jews are not responsible for what Israel does. We have to break this cycle of fear, of paranoia, that, that, that uh, the Zionists try to impose upon the Jews to silence them. And, and you, don't have, you know what? You could support Israel if you want. You could, America supports Afghanistan and Egypt, right? They're not the Jewish state. And you could support Israel if Israel, if America has interests in Israel without Israel being the Jewish state. Support it all you want, I don't care. If you're against it, you're against it. It doesn't matter. All I'm saying is if you support it, you are not supporting the nation state of the Jewish people. Get that out of here. The, 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 the Israel is not the nation state of the Jewish people. It doesn't represent the Jewish people. It's a claim that they make, and it's a lie, and it's a dangerous lie. It's dangerous both for Israel, because once you make the whole conflict into a religious war, it never ends, and it's even more dangerous for the Jews outside of Israel, who function as human shields for what Israel does. And um, now I guess we'll take questions. Yeah, yeah. We'll take much from you. I'd like to take a student first. Well, students? I'll come back to you. Over there. Where? Right? Well, I'll go ahead. Go ahead. I saw you. Uh, hi. So, yeah, I'm one of the students here. I guess starting with a little bit of a joke, um, kosher pizza is not that great. But other than that, I like um, But I guess going back to the theme that Jews are inherently or to practice Judaism properly is inherently nonviolent. Um, what then are your views on, say, a Jew who volunteers for the US military, who lives here in the United States? Does that discredit their Judaism? Um, at what level does uh, religion overwhelm our obligations to our nation state? Right. Uh, religion, meaning our loyalty to God, does override our obligation to our nation state, however, Jews also have an obligation to be loyal to their nation state. And if their nation state is doing the right thing, if you assume that the United States Army is doing the right thing, then yes, go join the United States Army. If the United States Army is commanding you to do the wrong thing, to murder people or something, then murder is a bad thing. Okay? But in general, the default is that Jews are loyal to their nations. I hang out a uh, American flag on the 4th of July in my house, my synagogue does, and I instruct my parishioners to do so as well. I am an American citizen. 
Israel is not my nation state. I am no more or less American than anybody else. And, and therefore, we are equally loyal to America. If the, the army will tell you to violate your religion, and you know what, thank God, in America they don't. In America they don't make the, orth I know many Orthodox Jews that are in the American army. And they have no problems, they have more problems in the Israeli army than they do in the American army. Well, thank you so much for your presentation, and particularly um, part of your thesis is that Jews are not naturally uh, violent, in fact they're actually non-violent. Um, and I would like your biblical hermeneutical interpretation of some of the texts. Well, speak up a little. I like your biblical hermeneutical interpretation of some of the biblical texts, which talks about, you know, how David is an armor bearer for Saul, and um, in this context, the um, message that went out was that you know Saul has killed his thousand, but David has killed his ten thousand. Also, in the context of the fact that when, uh, of course. Um, David is, uh, of course, overseeing the army, and he uh, falls in love with Bathsheba and has Uriah, uh, of course, which is Bathsheba's husband, put on the forefront of the fire line, and he is actually killed. And it's actually Nathan the prophet that tells him that David and you have basically committed a major sin. In addition to this, Moses, who kills a man and has him buried, and has to actually discover. And then finally, you know, when Joshua, who was Moses' minister, is actually told to drive out the Jebusites and to drive out the Canaanites from the land. And um, they do engage in militaristic, violent um, activities. So if I could have your biblical interpret uh, interpretation of what that actually means, because to me that sounds like violence. Okay, sure. Um, you understand that the Orthodox Jews have a um, uh, amendments, not really amendments, but a second part to the Bible, which we call the Oral Law. Similar, but not exactly, to what the Muslims have, what they call the Hadiths. And we have our traditional way of interpreting it, and I'll go through your questions one by one. First, King David. King David, indeed, was told by God that he is disqualified from building the temple because he shed blood. Now we assume, we know, according to our tradition, that even when David did shed blood, it was always according to God's will. There's self-defense, there's all sorts of reasons. Nevertheless, it was considered a complaint against David that he shed too much blood. That shows that Judaism is against that. In any other nation, in the olden days, David's shedding of so much blood would be considered heroic. In Judaism, it was considered not heroic. And our uh, authority, Maimonides, says that you see from the fact that King David shed all that blood and therefore he was disqualified by God to build the temple that nobody, not even King David, is perfect. But you have to understand that all other kings would be praised by their religion for their military victories and their military conquests. In Judaism, King David was criticized for it. Now, as far as Bathsheba with Nathan the prophet, We have a rule, it's a, a Jewish law, that rebelling against a king is a capital offense. Uriah, the person who David sent to the front lines, rebelled against the king because he referred to Yoav as Adoini Yoav, my master Yoav. Uriah should have been executed by law for being a rebel. Instead, King David figured, I'm going to give him a hero's death. I'm going to send him to the front lines. He took a look at his wife, Bathsheba, and said, this is a good woman, and it would be sad for her husband to die the death of a criminal. So I'm going to let him die the death of a hero and send him to the front lines, and I'm going to take this widow and make her a queen. Now, Nathan the prophet, we have a rule that the more righteous a person is, the more accountable he's held for even the smallest sins. 
somewhere deep, deep, deep inside King David's soul. He may have, he did something that looked as if he killed the husbands to get the wife. And for somebody with the moral obligations and the, 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 uh, and the job to be a role model like King David was, the optics were bad. And Nathan the prophet gave him hard rebuke because of that. But our tradition tells us that the narrative that I just said was the real story, or really, as they would say, the rest of the story. Now, what else did we ask about? Uh, Moses. You know, Moses who killed the Egyptian and buried him? That Egyptian was in the middle of killing somebody else. Moses wanted to save the victim, and therefore he did it. Plus, we have a tradition that Moses killed that Egyptian by praying to God, not by smiting him. Joshua. Joshua, he mentioned. No, first Moses, first Moses. But the last episode. Right, first Josh, Moses, episode, right. Now, Joshua, the Bible, uh, as far as the conquest is concerned, two things you need to know. Let's talk about God, who commanded Joshua to do that. Forget about, for a moment, let's set aside God's command to Joshua. Every year, millions of people die. If memory serves, I, I looked it up on the internet, I think 50 million people die a year all over the world. Who kills those people? God. What kind of God? causes people to have heart attacks, causes floods, causes famines, causes volcanoes, causes hurricanes, and causes death from old age. Now, that doesn't bother anybody, and nobody's, uh, nobody considers that problematic because we know that everybody has a time in this world, and we live in nature, and, and, and after this world, we go to the next world, and that's the way the world runs. What bothers us is where we see, mur murder is not when God takes somebody out of this world because that's his natural lifespan. Murder means that you cut somebody's life short before his lifespan was supposed to be over. So I have a question for you. If God were to command you that so-and-so's, let's say you were the angel of death, nothing personal. Let's say you were the angel of death and a car is driving down the Verrazano Bridge, they go into a skid and they crash into the gate and they're teetering, tottering, you know, and they're scared to move lest they tip the car over into the water. You're the angel of death. God says to you, those people in that car, their time in this world is up. Push it over. Now, if you know, if you're smart, you will follow that instruction from God. Because God gives life, and God taketh away life. If you don't, so, we have a story in the Bible where King Saul refused to kill Agag of Amalek, and Agag's grandchildren almost annihilated all the Jews, Haman in the book of Esther. If God says this person's life is over, it's over. God told Joshua that the lifetime of these Canaanim in the land is over. I'm, I'm, I'm going to be God now, okay? I'm going to, you're going to be Joshua. Listen, Joshua. I could kill these people with a flood. I could kill them with a famine. In those days, what was the life expectancy of a person? 30, something like that, right? I could kill them all right away. And I could send the, the angel of death. They're going to die anyway but now it's because of their sins. I'm giving the job to you so that people should know that the good people win against the bad people. And I will note miraculously cause the walls of Jericho to fall down and you will miraculously win the war. It is your choice, Joshua, whether you want to kill them or not. In other words, when God himself says somebody's life is over, that means it's over. Now, 
You may not believe that God commanded Joshua to do that, and that's your prerogative. But if you do believe it, then God, whose toiv Hashem lakol is King David, or God is good to all, when God says it's time for somebody to die, it's time for him to die. I will give you a theoretical. One day, let's say, somebody goes up after he dies to the heavenly court, and God says to him, you have a lot to answer for. Look what you're responsible for. And he shows him Hitler's concentration camps. And he says, that's your fault. And the guy says, what do you want? What are you crazy, Hashem? God, what do you mean? I lived a thousand years before this Holocaust. What do you want from me? And God says, you don't get it. You remember when I told you to kill this and this person? That was Hitler's great, great, great grandfather. Hitler was never supposed to be born. I, I run the world. I'm telling you, it, the best thing is for everybody, kill this guy. He deserves it. His time is up. If he would live longer, all he would do is wreak havoc in the world. It's for his benefit to die. You do the job, and then it'll be much better for the world. Your fault. You didn't listen to me. You thought you were smarter than God, and look what happened. Now, you may not believe this, that God tells prophets things, and if God doesn't tell prophets, then you're right. If some human being made this religion, then it is violent. But don't forget, you can't take the religion halfway. The only time this type of violence, as you refer to it, is justified, is if God revealed that in his master plan for the world, the time for these people to leave the world has arrived. It's just a question if it's the angel of death or a human being that does it. So it's not a violent religion. We don't have prophecy anymore. And if anybody claims that God told him to kill somebody, we know he's a lunatic. Throw him either in jail or in, in Bellevue. But in those days of miracles, where God split the Jordan River for Joshua to go in, and he made the walls of Jericho drop, God revealed his plan for the world, who should live and who should die. And everybody dies. God kills everybody. If that doesn't bother you, then the method God uses, or the agent that God uses, philosophically, intellectually, should not bother you either, if you accept the truth of the Bible. I we'll take a couple more, couple more questions. If I, no, if I could just have one quick response, just one quick response. Well, uh, but quickly, Phil, very, so we get... I you very quickly. However, the issue as it relates to David and Uriah is not that this is an honorable death necessarily, for Uriah, how, what initially happens is that David Uriah. looks out the window and he sees that Uriah? Uriah. Uriah. Okay. Well, we call it Uriah. Okay, okay. I got it. But, but she, he's, he looks out the window and he sees Bathsheba bathing and she's naked. And he desires her. And not only does he desire her, he impregnates her. And to conceal the fact that Uriah would know about this, who is his armor and very loyal to him, he has him put on the forefront of the fire line and kills him. And in addition to this, yeah. it's not only just with it, it's not only that David does not get to build the temple, but the son of David and Uriah dies, and he pleads and prays for this, and the son does not come back and he dies. My question, if this was ordained by God and David was acting for God, why would God punish him for doing his will? And we can talk about that. Okay, point. the answer is because even if somebody does God's will, there are ways to do it where the optics are bad, and you know every yin has a yang, and a yang has a yin. So even if you do a, a very, very good act, somewhere deep down, there may be just a little self-motivation, uh, some, some self-serving motivation, even a good act could have self-serving motivation. And a righteous man like King David is judged by very strict standards. And that's why you're, you're using only the written Bible. We, have, we believe that the Talmud and the oral Bible um, explains, interprets the written Bible. And this is the interpretation of the oral Bible. So the story you said, you could say that my religion is wrong and that we don't know what we're talking about. 
We could discuss that. But if you can write, according to our interpretation, there was no problem. Yes? Yes. Um, let's assume for a second that I believe everything you said. Mm -hmm. To come up in front of Goyim and to make these arguments is Hilshonus, is it not? No. Favos Nesh? You're deliberately going in front of Goyim and speaking Lashon Har about Jews? No. What I'm doing is, uh, may I explain the question? Sure. Okay. His question is that I, I'm being like an informer because I'm saying bad things about Jews. I'm not saying anything new about Jews that the Jews themselves have gladly said to everybody. Vladimir Jabotinsky's statements are public knowledge. The only difference is I'm saying that this is not Judaism. So for example, if somebody were to say Bernie Madoff represents Judaism, and that he's a real Jew. And I were to get up and say, no, our religion does not approve of what Bernie Madoff does. That's not uh, informing at all. That's clarifying and protecting people from false accusations. I am not saying anything about the Zionists that the Zionists themselves do not proudly proclaim. Vladimir Jabotinsky proudly proclaimed that, and Mikhail Yosef Berdyshevsky proudly proclaimed that. The only question is, one question, is that Judaism or not? And like I said, could be. I'm not, if somebody wants to say that they're right and I'm wrong, that if Moses would be here, he would say that Jabotinsky is right and I'm wrong? You know what? You could believe that. I am discussing what Judaism allows. So if I said to people that uh, you committed a crime that nobody knows about, that's one thing. But if everybody knows that you 